Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If I could uh, encourage those of you who haven't done so to take your seats, and we will get started. Um, I'm Howard Davis, the director of the school, and I just wanted to begin by explaining uh, the choreography of this event so that you know what's going to happen. First, I shall say a little bit about the school and its connections with Mexico, and then we'll be pleased to hear from the ambassador, um, and then I have the honour of introducing the finance minister uh, after that. He will make a presentation um, about Mexico's economic perspective, uh, and then we'll have questions and answers, and we aim to wind up this session at about 20, 25 past two. So it's a great pleasure to be able to launch this uh, Mexico week. As those of you who are in the school know, uh, there is a kind of informal but nonetheless intense competition between the nationality societies uh, in the school uh, to organize uh, events which show off uh, their countries um, to uh, other students and to the school community um, as a whole. Uh, and um, these events take uh, different forms. Uh, the Chinese always organize them at the weekend because they're busy working all through the week. Uh, <laughs> Mexicans obviously take a different approach. Um, <laughs> the Germans have very, very intense and solemn uh, symposia uh, at which you're not allowed to make jokes. Um, but uh, the Mexicans and the Colombians uh, and, uh, have particularly taken the lead among our Latin American students um, in hosting a series of events over the years uh, to bring leading politicians and decision makers and academics uh, to the school. And uh, this is a very good example, this uh, Mexico week that the government department, George Philip and Susana Barquez have organized along with the Mexican Alumni Association um, and indeed our Mexican students. We are very proud of our contacts with Mexico. Uh, we always have a good group of Mexican students uh, in the school, usually 50 or 60 at any one time. Um, and uh, we have a growing alumni network in Mexico. We now know of about um, 1,000 Mexican alumni. In other words, we've got their addresses. And we also know that there are quite a lot of others who are hiding um, from us. Uh, possibly some are in prison, I don't know. But, um, uh, but we do now have a strong group, obviously, uh, centered in Mexico City. And indeed, uh, George was down there uh, talking to some of them just last week, I think, uh, oh, George. Uh, so this is a, a good network uh, for us. I think it's important for the school to cultivate its uh, alumni, and that's something we are keen to do in Mexico. Mexico uh, is, at the moment, um, as we're going to hear, in a good shape economically. I'm sure no one would wish to hide the fact that there are uh, security and crime challenges in Mexico, which we read rather a lot about in the press, and we read rather less about Mexico's economic prospects and its success in steering the economy through the dangerous waters of the financial crisis and the resulting uh, recession. At the moment, um, Mexico is in pretty good shape. Its banking system uh, is more solid than ours. Um, its uh, growth uh, has been more robust uh, than ours. Um, with the budget here only two days away, I was rather hoping that Senor Cordero had been advising George Osborne, but sadly, uh, George Osborne is rather preoccupied with his budget at the moment, but clearly could learn quite a lot uh, from what's been going on uh, in Mexico. And of course, in recent years, there has been quite a significant political transformation in Mexico. Uh, gone are the days when uh, everything you needed to know about Mexican politics was in three letters, PRI. Um, now there is a much more plural uh, democratic system. The old system of the uh, didasso, uh, the pointing finger who determined the next member of the PRI to be president, uh, is now well behind us. Um, and a much more vibrant uh, democracy is uh, in place. 
So it's an exciting uh, country, a fascinating country to study. I've been uh, there several times myself, usually as a guest of the Mexican Bankers Association, um, who like to hold their conferences in Acapulco. Um, you can actually, and I have done this, uh, get to Acapulco and back from London for a weekend. Uh, it is possible to leave the office on Friday <laughs> afternoon and get back in the office on Monday and speak in Acapulco. I can tell you how it's done. It's done via Chicago. It's a very unpleasant experience. But, um, <laughs> but it can be done, and I did it once when I was chairman of the, uh, of the FSA. Uh, however, uh, you don't need to uh, hear about my own uh, excitements in uh, Mexico. I have, been, I have even eaten gusanos. Uh, <laughs> which is one of the more unpleasant experiences of my life, I have to say. Um, but uh, what I'd like to do now uh, is introduce uh, the ambassador, uh, who is going to talk to us uh, and I hope say warm things about the links between Mexico and the UK, of which the LSE is an important part. And then, as I say, I'll be pleased to introduce the finance minister. Ambassador. Thank you very much, dear Howard Davis, Director of the London School of Economics, Ernesto Cordero Arroyo, Secretary of Finance of Mexico, dear Professor Philip, Head of the Department of Latin American Politics, dear members of the LSE academic community, ladies and gentlemen. In February 1922, Professor Edwin Cannon suggested that the phrase rerum cognoscere causas be the motto of the London School of Economics. Rerum cognoscere causas, or to know the causes of things, is literally the reason behind the existence of the institution where we gather today. It is a truism that we live in a hyper-connected world, which manifests itself in many dimensions. Some like it to call globalization others new world order. In any case, we are constantly reminded that the problems of the 21st century arise from this direct trait. But another truth that is often left un unspoken is that the solutions to these challenges can only be harnessed by making use of the strengths and potential of hyperconnectivity itself. While some portray today's societies as individualistic, ironically, humanity never before had greater possibilities of working in a cooperative manner in order to overcome its challenges. LSE, as a school that currently houses students from 43 different countries, is a reflection of globalization, but also a meeting ground for individuals to discuss how to render fairer societies through different approaches but with one common vocation, the forging of answers through reason. Mexico is precisely in that process today. Last year, we celebrated the bicentennial of our independence and the centennial of our revolution, the beginning of our third centennial. And as, as an independent nation, this year is a unique opportunity to rethink and reshape ourselves learn from our mistakes and achievements, and cast the future deserved by millions of ordinary Mexicans who perform extraordinary actions every day. Of the two preconditions necessary to fully unfold our potential, one being macroeconomic stability and the other security, we have fulfilled and successfully maintained the first for more than 15 years now even amid an unprecedented global financial crisis. The country is making important progress in the second one, improving security and the rule of law to recover peace and tranquility for our citizens in their communities. Our, we are a nation mainly formed by a growing sophisticated middle class. In 1994, Mexico became the first Latin American member of the OECD. Ours is the second country with more free trade agreements in the planet. We export more manufactured goods than the rest of Latin America combined. 
we have long played a significant role in the world, especially since the second half of the 20th century. But we must be all that we can be. Mexico's economy is one of the largest in the world, but within some years, it will rank among the top 10. We will continue to be a committed, leading, and trustworthy actor in multilateral affairs, from climate change to reshaping of international institutions, both financial and political. We will profit from our culture, demographic dynamics, advantage as a, as a major manufacturing base, sophistication to design, and certainly to keep implementing pertinent policies to cope with every difficult time and challenges, and I note, as we have done well in the past. We will do much better off in the future. For Mexico, history is written in future tense. It is about what is to come for us. It is up to us. The challenge now is to engage Mexicans in a new era of transformation, to consolidate functional institutions, but more so to integrate those sectors of the population that still remain on the margins of opportunities and services. We must enhance the capability of the state to provide sustained and increasing well-being for its population, to be able to create not the quality of conditions, but of opportunities. It is also the time for a renewed vision of how we engage ourselves with the world. The Mexican students at the London School of Economics are true representatives of the intellectual strength and creative spark necessary to drive the country successfully into its third centennial. This occasion marks a starting point of a unique opportunity in which, for four days, the London School of Economics will discuss the nature of Mexico's challenges, its inherent potential, and confidently point out some wise guidelines. I would like to praise our LSE students for their central role in conceptualizing and organizing this week, and to express my gratitude to the school for hosting this series of thought and debate on Mexico. I sincerely hope that this is a confirmation of a growing trend of London School of Economics engagement with our country, that it is already being highly rewarding for all. To open these sessions, we are very lucky to have here today Mexico's finance minister, Ernesto Cordero, a true representative on his own of Mexico's future leadership, along with other high-ranking members of our government who will be present throughout these days. Rerum cognoscere causas is not only <coughs> the motto, but also the reason why Mexico comes to LSE this week. On behalf of Mexico, welcome and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for those kind words, uh, some of them in Latin, um, which we always like. Um, it's uh, a curious uh, coincidence um, that the last person I introduced in this theatre, just last Thursday afternoon, um, was also uh, a former Mexican minister, uh, Angel Correa, who was here as Secretary General of the OECD. The OECD chose to have a 50th <coughs> anniversary conference uh, here at the uh, LSE, and he was the last person, as it happens, whom I uh, introduced. So we're delighted to keep this Mexican uh, tradition going. Um, Senor Cordero is a distinguished uh, economist, trained at uh, ITAM, um, and also uh, in the US at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, doesn't happen to have benefited from a British university <laughs> Education, but in spite of this handicap, um, <laughs> he, um, he has had a very distinguished uh, career uh, in Mexico, um, who, with a variety of jobs in the uh, public sector, um, and uh, was involved in the campaign uh, of President uh, Calderon, uh, working as a policy coordinator in that campaign. And at the beginning of uh, President Calderon's administration, was Under Secretary uh, for the Budget in the Ministry of finance and then uh, took over at December of 2009 from Agustin uh, Carstens um, as Minister of Finance. Uh, those of you who know 
uh, Carstens, as I, I do, will know that there is one key difference between the two of them, um, uh, which perhaps I won't uh, insist on. Um, I actually uh, had the pleasure of meeting your predecessor last. I've known, uh, known him for a few years. He came over for the G20 summit uh, in um, the spring May of 2009. And oddly, um, the G20 finance ministers were hosted at the Tate by Alistair Darling. And I was at that time briefly chairman of the Tate, and so I was the host um, of this uh, event, uh, although it was actually for the finance ministers. And I had the pleasure of uh, talking to uh, your predecessor, who said to me, well, have you got much Mexican art in here? And as it happened, I knew where the Diego Riveras were and the Frida Carlos, and I actually took him around this empty gallery whilst all the others were drinking, because he wanted to see the Mexican art at uh, Tate Modern. Uh, whether that meant he was excluded from some important decisions on the G20, I don't know, but I thought this was a man who had his priorities right. Um, anyway, uh, he didn't come to the LSE. We're proud that you have decided... Uh, to uh, come to us. Uh, you have a strong background as an academic uh, economist, which I think is always a good basis for being a finance minister. So we're delighted you're here and looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much, Howard, for your kind words. And uh, I will do my best, even that I didn't have a British education, I will do my best. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Philip, for organizing this event about Mexico. Dear Ambassador Eduardo Medina Mora, muy buenas tardes a todos. It's really an honor to be here, to, be, to have the opportunity to share with you what is the outlook of the Mexican economy for the next years. And uh, I will, my presentation is around 20 minutes, and probably it would be more uh, enriching for the discussion if we could have some questions and answers rounds. So let me begin telling you that Mexico is uh, a middle-income country. Mexico is one of the emergent uh, economies who has, that has one of the best outlooks. And uh, certainly that is because we have very strong fundamentals, and certainly because uh, we learn in the bad way that it's very, very important to handle carefully the economy, and we learned that uh, for a long time ago. So certainly we, we, we re rely on that premise, and we pay a lot of attention of handling economy uh, carefully. Just let me tell you that uh, in Mexico, we have a very, very strong discipline in public finances, we have, right now, we have a deficit that is 2.5% of GDP, <coughs> including Pemex. If we wouldn't include Pemex in this account, the deficit, uh, the government deficit in Mexico is less than half a point of GDP. That certainly it's a contrast of what is happening around the world, where uh, a lot of economies have huge deficits that are going on, and that translates in a very important debt with respect to GDP. In the case of Mexico, the debt uh, as a percentage of GDP, uh, even in the most aggregate measures, is no more than 35.2%, and uh, it's declining. That means that uh, we have the, the, the revenues to face the challenges that we have with respect to expenditure and infrastructure. How have, been, uh, how, uh, have we been able to do this? Well, basically, we have uh, strength revenues in Mexico. In the last four years, we have two fiscal reforms, and these two fiscal reforms increase fiscal revenues in 1.4% of GDP. This is the largest increase in revenues in probably in the history of Mexico for the first four years of any president. And secondly, we have been able to increase the base of contributors in Mexico. In the last four years, we have been able to increase the base of contributor in basically 10 million 
uh, contributors. So basically, more people is paying taxes in Mexico. These 10 million people is a, it's a very important number, and also we have been able to increase uh, the revenues. Sec uh, another thing that is important with respect to revenues is that we have been able we have been able to stabilize all production. I know that Carlos Murrieta is here, who is the head of Pemex with respect to operations, probably is the most informed people and the best expert that we have in oil in Mexico. And uh, as you remember, since 2005, 2006, oil production in Mexico began declining, and that's because our most important field, Cantarell, was beginning to decline. But uh, in the middle of 2009, we were able to stop that declination to manage it better, and also some of the other fields that were under exploration begin, begin showing some results. So basically, oil production in Mexico is stable. We are producing 2.5 million barrels per day, and we have been producing this uh, probably since the middle of 2009, and that's probably the, the forecast that we have for the next 13, 14 months, and after that, uh, production will be taken off again. So in, in terms of income, revenues, with respect to non-oil non taxes and with respect to oil, uh, things in Mexico look stable and improving. And with respect to expenditure, we have been able, with this increase in revenues, we have been able to face the challenges that we have. We have increased the budgets in social policy as never before. We have increased the budget in security as never before. And also we have invested in infrastructure as never before. So we have been able to make ends meet, even that in Mexico it's very difficult to increase taxes. We have been able to do it, and we have revenues enough to face the challenges that we have ahead. Um, our debt management. Mexico also, we have a very, very disciplined uh, debt management. And uh, the panel on the left shows you how our domestic debt is handled. And you can see the yield curve. The yield curve is basically uh, the relation between maturity of a government, uh, government bond with respect to the yield that is paying. And you can see that right now the, the line in blue is 2005 and the line in yellow is 2010. And you can see that right now our bonds are, have longer, longer maturity terms and also are paying uh, smaller yields than before. A uh, very important one is the, the panel on the right that is the same yield curve, but for our external debt. First of all, for those of you who are economists, the first thing that is important is that probably this graph 10 years ago in Mexico couldn't be possible to construct it because we didn't issue bonds longer than probably five years, at most 10 years. And now we have been able to allocate bonds five, 10, 30, and even 100 years. Mexico is the first Latin American country who has been able to issue a 100-year uh, bond. We issued that bond in October of last year. The yield is 6.1 percent, in uh, that it's a, a, a very decent uh, uh, yield. So Mexico right now in the international markets has a very strong and very good reputation, and certainly they are lending us money uh, longer terms and in better conditions. Uh, right now we are not. Uh, issuing new debt in the international markets, what we are doing is refinancing the previous one that we have. So we are switching older debt that was shorter term and larger yield, and we are substituting this for new paper that it has a longer maturity and we pay a more reasonable yields. So certainly that's also one of the strengths of the Mexican economy right now. With respect to inflation, inflation in Mexico, and that's another difference, very important difference right now, Mexico could be of the emerging markets and the leading emerging markets, probably the one that have, that do not have inflationary pressures at all. Right now, last year, we finished uh, inflation. We were expecting an inflation. The central bank target was between 4.75% and 5.25%, and we have been able to finish uh, in 4.52% of inflation. So we were, uh, you know, below what the central bank was expecting. That's very good news. And also what we are expecting for 2011 is that we are going to be between 2 and 4%. I know it's a very long range, but that's how the central bank decided to present inflation for this year. And the last measure that we have is that uh, in February, if we project this inflation annually, we are going to have an inflation of 3.57%. Uh, that's a very relevant number because even then we have inflationary pressures from abroad, 
As you know, there was a hike in the prices of commodities all around the world. This uh, was not translated in terms of prices in the Mexican economy, and that's very good news. Also, uh, the government bonds are paying uh, a very, very uh, reasonable interest rates. That's also good news for, invest for investors, for savers, and, uh, and for consumption also. Our financial system, as Howard mentioned, we have a very, very strong uh, financial system. Our banks are very solid. Again, we learned a lesson from the past, in, from the crisis of 94, 95, when the banking system in Mexico was part of the problem. And since then, we have regulated our financial system very, very tough, and we are overseeing very carefully. And that's why, uh, even when the rest of the world was having problems with the financial system in Mexico, the banking system was not a problem at all, was part of the solution. We have a, re uh, uh, a capitalization index in the Mexican banks of around 19%. Uh, that's uh, definitely more than the double of the, mini uh, the regulatory minimum of 8%. So that's very good news. And also our delinquency rate, that is people who do not pay their loans in the banks, is also very, very low, 1.1% right now. So this is really important because now our banks are very well capitalized and they are beginning to lend money to the Mexican economy. And that's very, very important because that's one of the engines of the Mexican economy. The expansion of credit in 2010 was more than two digits, around 10.1%. In, a, in every possible aspect, housing, a corporation, a small and medium enterprises, consumption. So all the aspects of credit increase in Mexico in a very important way. With respect to uh, our uh, risk management policy, uh, even that we cannot uh, be sure that nothing could happen, uh, but we have to be ready in case something happened. So we have been accumulating international reserves. Right now we have uh, $122 billion dollars and we also have a flexible credit line from the IMF that it's an insurance policy. That, that doesn't mean that we have that credit uh, performing. It's just an insurance, insurance policy. If you combine them, we are very close to $200 billion, and that gives you a great strength for our currency, and that provides us with a very solid ground to absorb any external shock that could happen in the future. Uh, also, we have, been, uh, we have hedged the oil price for 2011. Probably right now doesn't look relevant, but certainly this is very important. Nobody can be sure that prices are going to be high uh, uh, all the time, so you have to be sure that in case of the prices collapse, you have insured your oil price, especially for a country like Mexico that uh, relies uh, so importantly with respect to the oil price. And, and also we have been able, as you know, Mexico is one of the principal, principal destinations for natural disasters, cyclones, hurricanes, earthquakes. So right now, uh, for the case of public finance, it's very relevant to have enough resources to face reconstruction of infrastructure and to put together and to put and to stand up as soon as possible any particular region of the country when we have a natural disaster. And we have a fund and we, right now we can face uh, natural disasters that go up to 50,000 million pesos. This is uh, a very important amount of money and we can face reconstruction up all, up, all the way up to this amount. And uh, all these things, uh, it's, it, we have been advancing not only with respect to macroeconomic stability, we have also tried to advance as much as possible with an agenda of simplification and deregulation, and this is showing some results right now. Uh, I am going to mention, or the, the, the graph here shows you, what is the ranking, the 2011 doing business ranking, uh, that it's elaborated by the World Bank. Uh, differently from some other rankings, this, is, this ranking relies only in hard data, in observable, uh, observable information that is collected by very important international consulting firms with the same methodology all around the world. So uh, what is considered in this ranking? How easy is to start a business? How easy is to deal with construction permits, uh, registering property, getting credit, protecting investors? How easy is to pay taxes? How easy is to enforce contracts? How easy is to trade across borders? And how easy is to close a business? All of these elements are ranked with the same methodology, and countries are ranked from one to 183. Being the first one, the country that is more friendly to embrace a business. In the case of 2011, the country where it's 
the easiest to embrace a business is Singapore with the number one position. The first Latin American country that appeared on this list is Mexico in the position number 35. Just to give you an idea, the, the previous uh, report, I, I think it's 2009, Mexico was in position number 76, as far as I remember. So we advanced 35 positions, that is quite good. And we are the first, uh, well, according to this report, Mexico is the best country to do business in Latin America. We are ahead of Colombia, ahead of Chile, and very well ahead of Argentina and Brazil. So uh, all of this uh, context, all of this situation, what is the, the, the overview for the Mexican economy in the future? Well, of course, certainly I didn't mention it, but uh, it's important what are we expecting from the uh, American economy. Our uh, expectation for the American economy is very humble. We, 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 don't, we don't think that uh, something miraculous is going to happen for the American economy, but we think that they are going to be growing around 3.1, 3.2%. That is a very conservative forecast for them. And uh, that the industrial production in the United States is going to grow around 4.5, 4.6%. So that's, that's the, the, the assumptions that we include in our forecast. And also, of course, we are concerned of what could be happening here in Europe. It is not clear how the situation is going to be fixed, but uh, we are paying attention to that. We don't feel that there are very, very strong uh, sources of contagious from what happened in Europe of what could happen in Mexico. So in terms of international arena, what it's, it's being relevant is what happened in the United States. So uh, 2010, we were able to grow 5.5%. This is probably the largest growth rate in, in several decades. And, uh, and uh, well, I'm sorry, in, in, in I think that in 1999 we grew 6%, but these two, these two years are probably the, the best in, in several decades. And also uh, our forecast for 2011 is that the Mexican economy is going to grow between 4 and 5%. All of the forecasts of all the experts, Mexicans or internationals, from government or private, coincide that now the, the forecast is improving. Now we are between 4 and 5%, and uh, all these forecasts are being updated every two or three months, and uh, so far we have been improving the forecast every time. And uh, with this uh, economic uh, growth rate, right now the GDP per capita adjusted by purchasing power parity, that is the, the GDP per person, and when you adjust it, uh, uh, you adjusted by a basket of goods and you adjusted by the prices in each country. That is the GDP per capita adjusted by PPP, uh, purchasing power parity. Mexico has uh, $14,000. Uh, Russia is, we are very close to Russia, that is 15, and we are ahead of Brazil, that has 11, China, that has $7,000, and India, that has $3.3,000. Per capita, these, these are official numbers from the International Monetary Fund. And uh, again, what, what are the drivers of the Mexican economy? What is going to be happening this year and in the in the next future? Well, certainly the Mexican economy has two engines. One is the internal market, the domestic market, and in this market, Mexico uh, is, is beginning to show a strong signs of recovery. At the beginning, uh, what pulled us out from recession was our external sector, our export, uh, export side. And the domestic market was a little bit lag and, and numbers were not quite good. But uh, since the last quarter of 2010, uh, a very, very strong recovery began to show in the internal market and in the domestic market, and, uh, uh, and it keeps continuing so far. So uh, uh, all, all of the indicators with respect sales, with respect consumption, with respect investment looks quite well in the Mexican economy. And uh, we have been able to create in 2010 730,000 uh, 730, new jobs in 2010. That it's also one of the largest job creation rates uh, probably in 16, 17 years. That's very good. So far we have been able to to uh, compensate the jobs that were lost during the recession of 2008 and 2009. Uh, the unemployment rate, uh, in, in, in terms of an international comparison, we have an unemployment rate that is below Brazil, below Germany, below Argentina, Canada, Chile, certainly the United States and Spain. 
So uh, even that we are facing a challenge to create jobs as fast as possible, the unemployment rate <coughs> in Mexico is, uh, is one of the lowest with respect to uh, uh, comparable countries and even developed countries. Uh, we are going, and for us it's strategic, to keep investing in infrastructure. Infrastructure uh, has a lot of benefits, not only because of the direct jobs that you create, but also because of the positive externalities that creates. That is what, uh, it has very import a lot of importance from a regional perspective that creates a, a regional economic dynamic uh, in, in, in every part of Mexico, but also that uh, provide us or, or, or give us the possibility to take advantage in terms of trade of our geographical location. Now it's easier to move products from any port in Mexico towards the United States, so it's very important. And uh, right now we are investing uh, almost 5% of GDP. To give you an idea of, 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 of the magnitude of this, of, this, of this figure, is consider the average in the OECD countries. The average in the OECD countries is 3.3% of GDP, and Mexico is investing 4.8% of GDP, just to give you an importance for this. And we will keep uh, investing in infrastructure uh, in a very important way. Uh, what is the story? Uh, and of course, uh, also in the internal side of the economy, we are promoting and fostering small and medium enterprises. We, we, we are, dis we, we are divide, uh, deciding or designing policy especially for them. And what happened with the external driver with the other engine of the economy? Well, it looks quite strong. Mexico uh, has a very, very, we are very competitive exporting and uh, right now we already recover the levels that we have before the crisis. And just to give you an idea, and, and, and the, the kind of products that we are exporting has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. At the beginning, when Mexico opened to train, we, we rely a lot of manufacturers, but were manufacturers very, very simple, with no a lot of uh, added value cost on them. And now our manufacturers have evolved in a very important way. Now we are uh, producing manufacturers that are high technology manufacturers and that add a lot of, of, of value to the products and also increase the productivity of the Mexican workers and also are increasing the wages of the Mexican workers. Just to give you an idea, one of every seven cars circulating in the United States is manufactured <coughs> in Mexico. Uh, the Mexican aerospace industry occupies the first place in manufacturing investment in the world. <coughs> So probably we, we are not designing planes yet, but it's very, very possible that you have been in a plane where the turbine, the, 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 turbine, the engine of the plane was built in Mexico, or where the, the, the electronic devices that make the plane flight were uh, constructed in Mexico. So it's, it is very possible. And also just to tell you that the one out of two blackberries that are in the world were constructed in Mexico. So it's also very possible that your BlackBerry was built in Mexico also. So uh, we, uh, we, are, we have a very important uh, and competitive advantage with respect to exports. So uh, all of these things, the two engines of the economy are in place. We are feeling very comfortable and very optimistic that we are going to have another good year of economic growth. But uh, what is relevant of all of this is how this translates in the in the conditions and the living conditions of the Mexican society and the Mexican population. That is what is relevant. It's very difficult to justify economic, macro, economic stability if these do not translate in better conditions of living for Mexicans. And uh, just, uh, this is the last slide, and just to give you a sense of how are uh, the living conditions in Mexico, I'm going to use the Human Development Index. This index is uh, des uh, designed by the United Nations uh, Development Program. It, it, it used the same methodology a long time and across countries, so it's comparable a long time and comparable across countries. And uh, the, the best uh, qualification for this index is one. Uh, this is full development here, uh, countries that are very, that are completely developed in terms of human conditions. And uh, the lowest is zero, those countries that lack completely of human development. Mexico is the line in yellow, and uh, we have been improving since 1990 uh, all the way to 2010. And basically, we have been improving a long time, not only 
since 1990. But you can see that the, the living conditions in Mexico has improved uh, in an important way, and that the living conditions in Mexico are better than the, some other countries that, uh, that we should be surprised. For example, Russia, the living conditions in Mexico are better than in Russia, are better than in Brazil, and definitely better than in China and in India. And we are very close to Chile, that traditionally, and that's true, Chile has a very, very strong social policy that, uh, uh, that relies a lot in the distribution of income. So uh, clearly, the Human Development Index considers three things, income per capita, access to education, and access to health services. Basically, those are the three elements that are considered here, and it's a very good number to put together in only one figure what are the living conditions in some in countries. And uh, I would like to finish this presentation just to make a, a, a disclaimer. The purpose of this presentation is not to tell you how wonderful is Mexico and that we are just a couple of meters from paradise. That's not true. Mexico has a lot of challenges. We have huge challenges. We have a huge challenges of poverty. Mexico is not a poor country. We are a middle-income country, but we have a huge challenge of poverty. We have a challenge in security, and we have several challenges that we are facing, and we have to solve it. But it's very important to have the correct diagnostic in order to be able to design the proper policy that is going to help us to face our challenges. If we neglect that we have, an, uh, that we have been advancing in the last years, if we neglect that Mexico is advancing towards the right direction, probably the conclusion is that we have to begin again, and probably we will be uh, just destroying what, what we have been building in the last, in the last few years, and that uh, probably is not a very good idea. So again, Mexico is advancing. Still, we have huge challenges ahead, and that's probably part of the discussion that we should be debating in Mexico right now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, fascinating presentation. I, um, I like the phrase, we're not a couple of meters from paradise. Um, you are, of course, a couple of meters from Texas, which is not, uh, not the same thing. Um, I'm going to uh, open it up uh, to questions, but let me uh, have the chairman's prerogative of um, asking the first, the first question. Um, one thing you didn't mention, which is preoccupying a lot of people around the world at the moment is uh, how the global economy generally, but also individual countries, will be affected by the oil price and if we have a sustained rise in the, uh, in the oil price. Um, and given demand, but also the turmoil in the Middle East, you know, that, that possibility is now very much on the agenda. How, how would Mexico be Affected. I mean, obviously, you have your own oil production, but you clearly are affected by the state of demand in other countries, which will be uh, perhaps depressed. Have you, have you thought about that, how your optimistic prognosis would be affected by a sustained rise in the oil price? Yes. Um, well, certainly that's, that's a very, probably right now, the most important risk that the Mexican economy is facing. And it has... Uh, Two perspectives. One, that I think that it's the most relevant, is that it could be a deterrent to global recovery. And, 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 and in the case of Mexico, that, that is crucial. We, we, we have to have an economic recovery in the United States, even if it is humble, that's fine, but an economic recovery. It could be very critical for the Mexican economy if the United States again goes into a recession uh, because of this. And uh, very high prices in oil, yes, yeah, certainly can can put this in a scenario where a, a, a double dip, a double recession could happen. At this precise moment, with the prices at the at the at the level that we have it right now, we don't think that it could be possible to have a double recession with the prices as they are right now. That they are very high, but still, I don't think that there is any. Uh, reasonable possibility of another recession. But uh, this claim cannot be sustained if prices keep rising and keep rising and they remain very, very high for, long, for some months 
uh, ahead. So the main concern for us is that uh, a very, very high oil prices, and certainly that's not a good idea for the Mexican economy because this could deter a global recovery. The second perspective is that, well, Mexico is an oil producer, and it could be a very good idea to have a lot of the windfall of very high oil prices. Well, that's, that's true, that's true, but that's not completely true because uh, uh, we have good news and bad news. The good news is that if the oil prices are very high in, in the case of Mexico, well, we are going to have uh, more money because of selling oil to the international markets. That's right. But the bad news is that uh, also with, uh, uh, we have been having an appreciation of our currency. And also, in this precise moment, we are receiving less pesos per dollar than they were planned in the budget. So uh, there's a relation between the oil prices and the appreciation of our currency because of the way how the budget is constructed. So there's a, an automatic mechanism that balance the, the windfall in oil prices. And also, Mexico is one of the few countries, and certainly the only country in the OECD, that is still subsidizes gasolines in Mexico. So the, gas, the subside of the gasoline uh, basically is very simple. It, it, it refers to the international reference with respect the fixed price determined uh, in Mexico. In Mexico, we have a, a fixed price for gasolines or, an, or a managed price for gasolines. And the difference between those two is the subsidize. And right now, because the international reference is just hiking up, the subsidy, the subsidy in gasolines in Mexico is just dramatically increasing, and that has a huge cost for Mexican society. So also, even uh, in this second perspective that would be very nice to have very high prices, it's not completely clear that, that it's also going to help us a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who else would like to come in? There are microphones here. Yeah, man in a pink shirt. Thanks. If you give your name and then... Yes, my name is Julio Gonzalez. I am a PhD student here at the LSE. And my topic of research is the informal economy. And based on this uh, research, I would like to know if you can, well, if you could speak a little bit about the uh, tax on uh, cash deposits that uh, the government implemented a few years ago and how this has been developing. Thank you. Yes, as. Yeah, that, that's a very important point of, 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 of the weaknesses of the Mexican economy, the informality. And uh, a way to, to, to face it is that, uh, as you know, we impose uh, a tax to cash deposits in the banks. So if uh, you go to a Mexican bank and make a cash deposit, you are going to be charged with a tax. If you are in the formal economy, if you are a contributor, uh, a tax contributor in Mexico, then this, uh, this charge is going to be uh, deducted uh, from the, the taxes that you should be paying. In other words, is that if you are a formal contributor, you are not going to be charged at all. It's only that once you present your, your declaration, then what you have paid because of this tax is going to be considered uh, uh, for the, the payment that you have to be made by other taxation. In the case that you are in the formality, then you are going to be charged fully with this tax. And it has, uh, the performance of this tax has been quite well. It has, it, it has helped us a lot to control and to have an idea where a lot of informality is right now. We are not collecting a lot of money from this taxation because most of the, tax, uh, most of the uh, partial revenue that we have are going to be uh, return to contributors later on. But certainly it has worked quite well in order to have a better control, a more efficient fiscal system, and certainly it's providing a lot of information that is certainly helping us for many other purposes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was someone, a woman here, and then I've caught you as well. Yeah. Hi, my name is Anne Martinez. I'm a mas well, I started my master's here. And my question is, well, I actually have two questions, and I think they are related. And the first one is about inequality, and what basically, what's the role of inequality on how the, the economic growth and the macroeconomic stability is uh, affecting uh, the typical Mexican family? And the second one, and I think it's related to this, is uh, on the side of the success with the macroeconomic uh, management, uh, what other strategies apart from the regulation and the support to the PMEs 
are now in place by the government that are, that are uh, improving the productivity at the microeconomic level. Thank you. Well, certainly, uh, I'm sure that th there should be formal models that uh, explain uh, inequality and economic growth, uh, but uh, probably that that's not the point right now. But certainly there's a correlation between economic performance and uh, equality in a society. And, uh, and certainly that's something that uh, the Mexican government is addressing right now. And as you know, Latin America is one of the most unequal regions in the world, and Mexico happens to be also a very unequal country uh, also. We have been improving the, the, the distribution of income. Uh, there is a, a, a slight improvement in the distribution of income in the last measure that we have. If you compare the distribution of income in the 90s with the distribution of income in the, in, in the first decade of this century, there is a very uh, mild recovery and improvement with respect to the distribution of income in the case of Mexico. That's good news. The bad news is that it's very, very... Uh, it's very, very slim, the, the, the gain that we have, and certainly that, 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 that's a regularity everywhere. This is probably one of the indicators, the Gini coefficient, for example. This is one of the indicators that uh, it, it took longer to move uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a discrete way. It, 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 it's very hard to move this, but uh, we are advancing on that with the kind of social policy that uh, I think is very relevant. We rely a lot in conditional transfer programs that it's a, a very important uh, social policy program that uh, was created in Mexico and was exported to I, I probably 29 countries all around. And it's, it's, it's a very good program that has very good results, that it's accountable, and that all the indicators that are related to this program are improving. Uh, more uh, infant mortality, uh, uh, years at school, uh, health coverage, all of the indicators related with this program are improving dramatically, and certainly that also help to have a better distribution of income in Mexico. With respect productivity, I think that probably we have to do more than we have uh, been doing right now. And uh, just a, a moment ago, I was, I was uh, discussing with Alejandro Hernandez, the vice rector of ITAM, and certainly he has a very interesting uh, data with respect to productivity in Mexico and how the informality is affecting productivity in Mexico. So far I can tell you that the productivity related to the export sector of the Mexican economy is improving. Certainly there's a lot of gains in productivity in that part of the economy, but that this productivity has not been able to translate to other parts of the economy, to the non-tradable sector of the economy, to the informal sector of the economy, and certainly that's a huge window of opportunity that we have to be, that we have to take advantage for that. We have to invest in technology, we have to invest in small and medium, and medium enterprises, but focus is that they could be efficient and they could be productive. There's a, uh, I'll take the woman in the middle with the black shirt, but um, just while you're getting the microphone, there's a new book which was launched here about three weeks ago by a World Bank economist uh, about inequality, who asks in the first chapter the question, who is the richest person ever in the history of the world? And he says, well, that's not an easy thing to ask. You need to be clear what you mean. And he says, well, what I mean is the person whose income was the largest number, uh, the largest proportion of the income of the citizens of the country in which he was at that time. In other words, you know, your income represents how many thousand people in your country at that time. So he looks at people like Crassus in Rome and Croesus and people like that and Khodorkovsky and Bill Gates. But the answer is that the richest person ever in the history of the world is Carlos Slim. <laughs> with four, the in income of 440,000 Mexicans. Um, and Kolokovsky was number two, but of course he's now in jail. So um, there we are, your black, um, black shirt. Yeah. Hello, my name is Mariana, and my question is exactly about that. <laughs> I'm a graduate student here at LSE. 
And the, Dr. Cordero, my question is, in the most unequal country of the OECD, we have a Gini index of almost 0.5, and with an average of eight years of education, could you please explain the rationale used by the finance ministry to make private education tax deductible? Because it seems to widen the gap between the privileged in Mexico and the rest of the population. Well, just provide with some update for the numbers that you mentioned. And uh, well, yeah, certainly the, the Gini coefficient for Mexico is uh, right now 0 0.48. That uh, the order of magnitude in the Gini coefficient is, is, is very relevant. So. Uh, just to make it clear, and uh, also the average years of education in Mexico, according to the last census, is uh, 9.1 years, not five. So I think that, that, that's a very important advancement that we have, and this is just uh, a very recent number that INEGI just make it public uh, we, in the last census, so that, that, that's important. And uh, let me tell you that uh, uh, these four years of government, we have invested in education, in public education, as no other administration <coughs> before. We have increased the coverage of education to 100% in basic education, to 66% in high school education, and to 30% in university education. And that's a huge improvement with respect the numbers that were before, especially in high school and especially in university education. So we have invested a lot on this. Now we have opened near uh, 97 new universities in Mexico, public universities in Mexico. We have opened near 1,000 high schools, <coughs> public high schools in Mexico. And we have invested heavily in dignifying the infrastructure of public education, basic public education. Uh, Nobody invests in, in, in the infrastructure of public schools in Mexico probably in the last 15 years. And for the first time, we have been able to invest on that, dignify those schools. Of course, there's a long way to go, but we have been able to advance. Also, uh, what, what, what's the logic of making uh, the, the deducibility of private schools in Mexico? First of all, that to realize that our medium classes in Mexico are, are families that not have as a strong income as everybody expects. We are thinking about families that have a huge or made a huge effort to make ends meet. And we are talking about families that are not rich at all. And certainly because of the reasons that probably is not, uh, well, that's not part of this discussion, but they have one or two kids in a private school, and certainly that's a way to help them with their income and to foster and to promote medium classes in Mexico that, again, they are not rich. The way that the disability was, uh, was done in Mexico, we try to prevent a regressivity of the measure. Uh, as you know, the, 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 the disability has a cap, so it is not the full tuition that is deductible in Mexico. It's only though, uh, 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 a part of, that, of the total tuition that is the cost that will have to have the government if we were providing that education. So that's the cap that we have. And, and certainly we believe that that is going to help us in terms of in, in economic terms, that's going to help the domestic market, that's going to increase the disposable income of the families in Mexico. And again, we are talking about families that are not rich at all. Our medium classes in Mexico and in Latin America still has a long way to go in order to strengthen and in order to have a, a reasonable disposable income. Thank you. Uh, gosh, uh, forest, of, forest of hands. Uh, I think the woman in the uh, sort of purple shirt and then I'll come to the... Uh, it's a question, I guess, related to inequality as well, but I guess one of the great news. Um, sorry, my name is Lisa Madrigal. I'm unfortunately not a student, um, but pretty really pleased to be here. Um, this increase in base contributors, which is a key, I mean, it's a key achievement from my perspective, coming from the middle class and seeing how there's been squeezing in the basis of more popular measures. How do you take into account the revenues from Mexicans working in the U.S. and with stronger um, 
Now, immigration rules from the U.S. government, how is that going to take into account in the next coming years, and how are we going to benefit from those taxes, uh, from those revenues, I guess, uh, in terms of non relying on the oil exports and the oil revenues? <coughs> and my second question is around inequality more in detail. I always hear 40% was the number of Mexicans in proportion to the population living below the line of poverty. That was in, during the Salinas administration. How has this administration perform against that? Can we say that it's 38% now, 39%, or is there any way that we can see how the gap is, is closing down, and how is your expectation from that in the next years or so? Thank you. So, first of all, uh, remittances, as that's, that was your first question. Well, uh, certainly the, the, um, the fact that remittances are less than were before is affecting the income of several families or a lot of families in Mexico that were part of their income, the, 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 the remittances that were received from their family or, or relatives in the United States. Uh, the, it, it is not clear that this situation is going to improve in the short term. We, it has improved with respect to the recession, but so far it hasn't improved as it were before the crisis. Because of a simple reason, men, most of the Mexicans uh, that are across the borders are related to the construction sector. And the construction sector in the United States is, is, very, is, 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 is very lag with respect to economic recovery uh, in the United States. So it is, unfortunately, it is reasonable to believe that these, uh, the, the remittances are not going to increase uh, faster. In the, in the next future. And of course, this is affecting the income of, of, of these families. Yes, it is. And, and, and this has been uh, the, the, the situation in the last uh, probably two or two and a half years. So this is not a new phenomenon in Mexico. And so far, we already uh, internalized this situation in all the assumptions that we are doing. This is not going to be a new situation. The situation has been the same for the last months. So, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's something that is affecting the income of, 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 of many families in Mexico. And, and second, what's uh, the number of the population below the line of poverty? Well, it, uh, it's, it, it depends in which line of poverty you use. In Mexico, we, we use in the past uh, three lines of poverty, or three lines of income, it depends. And uh, this was what we call pobreza alimentaria, uh, alimentary poverty. The second was, was uh, pobreza uh, de capacidades, abilities poverty. I don't know what could be the translation. And the third one is uh, patrimonial poverty. And uh, these are very uh, more strict income lines than the, the ones used internationally. And in the case, for example, in the case of Mexico, the, the, the alimentary poverty line, I think, is around $2.4 per day. So it's the number of Mexicans that live with less than $2.4 per, per, per day. And, and again, just, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, talking this number by memory. Just uh, probably there could be some imprecis imprecision. The, 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 the next line is uh, the number of Mexicans that live with less than $3.8 per day. And the last one, the patrimonial poverty, is the number of Mexicans that live, I think, with less than $4.2 per day. It depends in the valuation of particular baskets that were devised by INEGI, and that, that's it. The international comparison that uh, it's used uh, in the World Bank and in some other multinational institutions are the number of the citizens or well, the, of the population that lives below $1.25 per day. So it's, 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 it's more relaxed than the measures that we are using in Mexico. And uh, that creates some sorts of confusion because of course uh, some people tend to use the most, the largest number, and, uh, and claim, for example, that the number of Mexicans living in poverty are the Mexicans that live uh, under the, 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 the patrimonial poverty line, 
that it's right now around 48% of population. And compare that number with the numbers uh, internationally, with the numbers that the figures that appear in some other countries. And that would be very, very misleading. For example, if you make numbers, uh, the, 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 the line of poverty used by international organization, that is 125, we have that 8 million Mexicans live under the line of poverty. That it's a very, it's a very uh, completely different number from the 48 that we had before. So for, for, for international comparisons, the number that should be used is the one that number of Mexicans living with less than one, 125. But in any case, this is a very imperfect indicator of the living conditions because it will not say anything with respect of access of education, with respect health coverage, with respect living conditions in their houses. It, it only refers of, 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 the, of the purchasing power of, of a particular person. So it's a very imperfect indicator of that. So right now in the law, in the new law of social development that was approved probably four years ago, there is an improvement for this and they discontinue these uh, poverty lines and they claim for a new and more integral indicator of the living conditions in Mexico. It's, a, it's an indicator that considers income, that considers health, that considers education, that considers living conditions uh, on, on housing, that considers social security. And uh, it was, uh, for the first time, was computed this indicator, I think, that one year ago. And uh, if you consider all these, all these factors together, uh, uh, the, the, the poverty indicator, according to the UNIS indicator, is that 11% of population in Mexico is under uh, poverty, according to, the, to those new, new, new measures. So let me tell you that even uh, the, the living condition in Mexico has been improving uh, constantly. There is not a single indicator in Mexico that has not improved. Anyone, with respect, education, the numbers of years in education, coverage, in terms of, of health, uh, mortality, uh, infant mortality, mother mortality, uh, in terms of, uh, of, of chronic malnutrition, also we have improved a lot. In the size of the kids, we have improved a lot. In the expectancy of life, we have improved a lot. In the living conditions in Mexico, also we have improved a lot. Almost 90% of the houses in Mexico has drinking water, according to the last data of the census. More than 98% have electricity. Uh, I mean, any indicator that you take is showing an improvement in the living conditions in Mexico. The only indicator that shows some retrocess with respect to the past is the one that refers to the lines of poverty. And this is very simple. This is because it is a very imperfect indicator of, of living conditions and refers only to the purchasing power of a particular individual. And during the recession of 2008 and 2009, almost in every country, everybody has to go back with respect to this indicator because the living conditions of the people everywhere in the world with respect to their purchasing power deteriorates because of the crisis. There was no way to avoid it, and Mexico was not the exception. So that's the only indicator that has uh, or, or deteriorates with respect to the previous one, and this is because of the economic crisis. Thank you. Uh, man, yes, just uh, blah. <coughs> yeah, sort of reddish tie. That's it. Hi, Ernesto. I'm Miguel Valle, and I want to ask you to what extent do you think violence in recent years has affected the development of the Mexican economy? Thank you. Well, I think that Mexico has a, a problem of, of, of or, uh, criminal organizations. That's not a secret or something that uh, could be neglected. And we have a very serious problem, but we are facing it and we are solving it. Probably, uh, I, I know that later on you will have several discussions with respect to security, so I'm not going to get into details. Just probably tell you that we are facing it, uh, improving our police corps, 
that we are facing it, dismantling the organization capacity of these criminals, and also we have very strong prevention programs that are going on for the last probably 18 months. But uh, yeah, we have a problem, we are facing it. And let me tell you that so far in the, in, in the aggregate level, there is no indication that uh, investing or the investment is not going to Mexico because of the situation. Of course, at particular regional cities, particular regional level, yeah, certainly it, it, it is the case that some investment is not uh, arriving to some particular cities, I'm not going to mention any names, but go to another city in Mexico. So in the aggregate, there's no evidence uh, that, uh, that we have been losing opportunities because of this. Uh, but uh, certainly I think that this is a, a, a serious real problem that we have to solve, that we have to face, and certainly the overview of the Mexican economy is going to look better once we solve this problem. Uh, yeah, man, the blue shirt just beneath the last question. Thanks. And then I got you. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Will Petty. I'm a consultant in the field of trade facilitation and, and customs administration. My question relates the, the security question a little, little, a little bit to international trade. Um, you painted a very clear picture of economic growth and, and increasing volumes of trade. And clearly in, in any economy, the imperative of controlling security and collecting revenue is, can compete uh, with the imperative of facilitating trade. I wondered whether, firstly, you saw that as a genuinely increasing challenge in Mexico, um, and then secondly, if, if so, what, what strategies um, you, you'll be deploying to, to meet that challenge? Yes. Well, that's, uh, uh, that's one of the, of the most important challenges of, of my job right now. As you know, uh, the, the Secretaria de Hacienda is uh, responsible for customs. And, and that's it, that, that's a clear trade-off between security and being able of, of legitimate fair, free trade going on in our customs, and especially in a country that is so oriented to the, to, to, to the export. So certainly that's, that's like a conundrum that we have to fix it. What we are doing right now, and that's part of the policy, we are investing a lot of resources in, in high in technology of non-intrusive detection devices in the customs so that we, have, we, could, we could be able to detect arms, uh, cash, drugs in the border without stopping the, the shipment that using X-rays, gamma rays, and some other uh, high-tech devices. It is possible to detect in a reason, reasonable amount of time what is, what is in every shipment, and that's what we are doing. We have been equipping right now the most important uh, ports, the customs in the most important coast in Mexico. But that's, that's a plan that we, that we are uh, advancing on. The, the, the plan is to have non-intrusive devices in every custom in Mexico, or at least in the more important ones, in order to have a, 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 a safe border, but also to be able to facilitate trade uh, in the borders. Uh, yeah, they're just too along from uh, stripey tie. <laughs> My name is Martin Torres. I would like to ask you, in the last 10 years, in average, 90% of the Mexican exportation have been concentrated in the American market. Uh, is the Mexican government doing something to change this trend, or that is the figure that we have to see in the following years? And also, what is the government doing to cover its risk in the, to the American dollar money, I mean price, sorry. Is it, can you repeat your second question? It's about how, how is the government covering its his risk with the dollar price change, you know? Because it's, the, the economy is still linked with the dollar mm. now. Uh-huh. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have you next, yeah. Ah. Hi, my name is Javier Hernandez from Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, central banks have been, shown some, have been showing some concern over um, uh, the U.S. budget deficit, and uh, as a result, they have been looking to diversify their reserves. 
So my question to you is, um, do you have any concern at this point, considering that you hold $122 billion? Um, the second question, um, the U.S. economy, um, the recovery of the U.S. economy is, uh, remains the engine for, for Mexico's recovery as well, as you mentioned earlier. Um, considering that the end of QE2 is in July, do you have any concerns that, uh, that this might prompt, might trigger the U.S. to go into a uh, double-dip recession and as a result affect um, the Mexican economy? Thank you. First, yeah, we have been doing very strong efforts to diversify our exports. Right now, that 90% that you mentioned declined to 82%. And so that, that's an improvement. And again, there's always good and bad news. The bad news is that this 10% that we advanced diversifying our exports were diversifying Europe. That right now is not <laughs> having a very a great moment. But again, that, that, that's the way that, that we are proceeding. We are looking to Asia. We are looking to Latin America. Right now, Latin America is a great opportunity. There, 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 there is a lot of middle-income classes consolidating in Latin America as well in Mexico. And certainly, that's an opportunity, and, and that's the way to go. We have to diversify. 80% of the U.S. market is still a lot, and, 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 and we have to diversify uh, as much as possible. Um, with respect to... Uh, 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 our currency and uh, and the relation with the dollar. Well, uh, we we right, probably I, I don't get your question uh, exactly, but right now we we rely in the in the in the market. We rely in the in the in the FX market. We we don't we don't think that we are going to intervene uh, the market at all. We are convinced about that, and and certainly. Uh, we we learned to live under the rules of the of the market since the 1990s, mid 90s when where we have a managed system. Right now we have a, 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 a to totally free floating system, and we, that's going to be that's going to be the same, and, and that's what we are going to do it. And um, that also relate to the to the budget deficit. Well, certainly we are concerned not because we have such amount of dollars in our international reserves. I think that the U.S. dollar will be remaining as a very, very strong currency in the, in the future. I don't see that something could happen that it's going to, to change this equilibrium at least in the, in the next future. So, but certainly we are concerned about the amount of the deficit. The U.S. budget deficit is, 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 is very, very important. And uh, as, as you know, nobody can get away with such a great deficit. At some point, they have to put the house in order, and that's going to be painful, and that's going to be difficult. But there are going to be difficult times for the, for the, for the U.S. Uh, to do that. And uh, well, let, let, let's, let, let's be prepared for that. And um, with respect to the Q2, uh, well, that, that's probably related to, to, to the other question. I think that it, it, uh, what is relevant or what we learn from the, from the past crisis is that we have coordination in policy and that we have to know when countries are going to change policy in advance in order to take proper actions to be ready and to be prepared if that is possible to face the, the challenges ahead. So certainly when the, 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 uh, when the monetary policy change in the United States is going to have an important impact in Mexico, of course the flow, the inflow that we are having right now certainly is going to change because most of the inflows, at least to Mexico, well, depends because between of the gap on the interest rate in the United States and the interest rate in Mexico. So certainly when, 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 when the, the, the monetary authorities in the United States decided to change policy, certainly that's going to affect this very crucial variable with respect to inflows in Mexico. So the, the, that's, that's something that we should be paying attention to. And also with respect to economic recovery, that uh, if this is going to tamper the economic recovery that the United States is, is, is having right now. So that, that, there are key questions that, uh, that we are uh, considering and we are incorporating in our policy tools, in our policy design, in order to, to at least be ready uh, when that, when, when that happens. Can we take one last one? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think it was down, down here, yes. We've been, I think you've been patient for quite some time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Miguel Molina. 
And uh, given that Mexican policy, Mexican politics is changing so fast, I think this question has uh, a right to be made here. If you were running for president, <laughs> or if you were in a position to advise someone who was, That's better. what kind of economic <laughs> policy would you suggest to continue with this growth and with this evolution of Mexican economics? Yeah. Well, if I were advancing, advising someone who <laughs> were running for president, I think that uh, in economic terms, I mean, there is, uh, you have to be very careful of what your decisions of, on, and what you are doing. And you have to pay attention to the history in the past. And uh, uh, just to make it very an easy example, at, at some point, some people begin advancing that during the crisis we have to expand our deficit, that it doesn't matter, just uh, expand uh, uh, the, a very expansive fiscal policy. And then later on, we will see how are we going to, to close the, the deficit. And that certainly was not a good idea. Uh, an, an, an expansive fiscal, fiscal policy is a good idea if people and the markets believe that you are going to have enough, enough money to pay for it in the future. If there is some credibility problem at all that you are not going to have enough money to pay for that, that's going to be a problem. And that's a very important lesson in some countries in Europe that, uh, I mean, uh, so, I mean, just pay attention to the history and uh, you have to be very careful in the way you handle the economy. Economic stability is, is a very good idea. You don't have to put on risk this thing. But I think that uh, what uh, is very relevant is how do you spend the public money that you have. And then the agenda and the challenges in Mexico are huge and are clear for everyone. And, and there are a huge challenge in terms of social policy. For example, we have a 100% coverage of basic education. So every children in Mexico have access to a basic school in Mexico. But now it's time to think about the quality of education that we are having in school. So we advance in coverage, the same in health system, but now we have to think about the quality that we have in our public system, in education, and also in health services. So that, that's part of the thing that we have to, uh, have to be paying attention to. With respect productivity, that's also a very key element that we have to pay attention to. We, we need to improve productivity. We have to transform the Mexican economy in this huge informality that we have into more formal one with uh, productivity gains that reflects in the wages of the Mexican workers. We have to put them in formality in order to be able to face the future. We are very young in Mexico, we are very young, so that's why we have to save uh, for our pension plans and we have to have access to health services in the future. Otherwise, we are going to be old and with no provisions at all of how to fund our elderly years and how to face our certainly increasing expenditure in medical attention that we are going to face in Mexico. So this is the moment to begin thinking about those issues that are going to be uh, in place probably 30, 20, 30 years from now, but certainly it could be the difference of having a, 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 a fair country or to having a, a very unequal country that, uh, that could be the case for Mexico. So in, we have a huge challenges in, in social policy. In microeconomic terms, it's productivity. And in terms of macroeconomic terms, it's stability and to be prudent in the way you handle the economy. Thank you very much. We've had a fantastic um, tour d'horizon of um, the Mexican economy. There were more questions we, we could have had, but I think we ought to um, bring it to a close. And thank you very much for dealing with all of these questions. I'm going to add uh, one thing to give you, which is our latest Nobel Prize winner, wow. Chris Pissarides' latest book on unemployment. So I'm sure that will be useful uh, for you. Uh, but thank you to the ambassador. Uh, thank you, Ernesto, to, to you. Um, thanks to George and the government department for organizing this, for the students and the alumni as well. Uh, it's been a fascinating um, hour and a half from my point of view, and we hope to see you back here one day. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.